Well, my name is Nikol Gorchevsky. Uh, I'm here with my co-presenter, Maria Matias. Uh, we're here to talk about instrumenting um, applications that are written in various dynamically managed runtimes rather than statically compiled binaries and some of the challenges we've experienced uh, working with these programming languages and applications. Um, I'll do the introduction sort of a little bit first and then Mario Matias will continue and then I'll come back after as well. Um, so this is going to be a really much uh, low level talk. Um, uh, maybe too deep for some of the audience here. Apologies for that in advance, but it's kind of hard to make a talk where it goes both high level and low level. So we'll talk about managed runtimes, the stuff they do, garbage collections. And we saw a lot of this stuff actually mentioned before by Val and Datadog. Um, we're going to talk about threading models, how they impact us, and um, two different technologies. So what stuff that we We've looked into Go, how we actually instrument Go applications, and some of the challenges there, and then switch over to what I call Death March from an, I guess, gaming reference uh, into Java. So, Mario, take it away. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Uh, to set the context of this talk, uh, we are auto instrumenting or we want to auto instrument applications using ebpf so for a given web application we want to get metrics and traces of the different service communications uh, with zero touch how do we do it we we have developed and released a product name grafana Bela, which uh, is deployed in the same host as your instrumented application and using eBPF it is able to uh, hook into the application runtime and libraries as well as the Linux kernel in order to get events and extract information from those events. Those events might be a service call for example and send those metrics and traces to Grafana, of course, but if not, we provide standard Prometheus and OpenTelemetry interfaces to, to send it to any other collector of your preference. Uh, the way to instrument binaries or the tools we have, uh, we can instrument the, the kernel code with K probes, but to instrument the user space binaries, we might use uh, U-probes and U-red probes, which are mechanisms provided by the Linux kernel, or user statically defined uh, trace points. With U-probes and U-red probes, we, we know when a function starts and a function ends, and then we can get these parameters information. From Bela, currently, we only use uh, U-probes and U-red probes as the users statically defined trace points are typically uncommon. Uh, OpenJDK use them but are not built by default. So this is an example of a uh, U-probe uh, of the code we need to attach into, the, in, into this example to a library uh, that, uh, in order to get when uh, a, an, a function starts and, and this, this is only the skeleton. This doesn't do anything else but getting the information we need. So since we need to know when a function starts and ends, we need to attach a uprobe and a uret probe that will be executed. The uprobe will give us some information like, for example, the, the buffer. This is the lib SSL3, the SSL read information. This way we can know when, when SSL data is being, is being read, we can get the parameters, like for example, the buffer or the size, and in the URED probe, we might know, uh, or we can know the return code. Uh, those events are executed independently from, from a program site, so those programs are stateless. We cannot store, uh, I mean, in, in, in main memory, uh, we need to store the data from the invocation to the end needs to be stored in BPF maps, which are special uh, data structures that run in the kernel. And also we need to take into account that even if the red probe is, is executed after the U probe, 
that doesn't mean that always after a U probe is executed immediately after comes a U read probe because this SSL read uh, function might be invoked multiple times in parallel from different from different threads. So when we store the the data of the U probe and we want uh, later in the red probe to know the information, we need to relate each call or each start with each end. For that case, we, we have a helper function that gets the current PID and thread group ID. This way we can relate, we can use this as a map key in order to, to know uh, or, or to store the, the arguments uh, when the U probe starts and to retrieve them when the U probe ends. That way we can relate each invocation, invocation uh, with each return. Uh, also, we are assuming some information, uh, we are doing some assumptions. Here it's a, rel it's a relatively simple example because LibSSL is written in C, it's, an, um, it's written in an unmanaged language, uh, in an unmanaged runtime. So we can do some assumptions like, for example, the buffer we are reading, the buffer with the SSL contents doesn't change. Uh, the, the address of that buffer, the buffer might change, uh, but the address of that buffer is the same when the function starts and when the function ends. This is not always the case in, in, in other languages from manager uh, runtimes. Um, we, we still need to, to take some, mm, some to take, uh, <coughs> to take some uh, caution because we are assuming here that uh, this li this library is, is will be always uh, uh, will have always the same structure, but libraries have versions, APIs might change, especially private APIs, and and we, that, that could mean that uh, if a user updates the library, a library, and it updates the, its API, it can introduce some changes in the code. At the kernel side, there is a mechanism named uh, VTF and CORE, compile on run everywhere, which allows that the code written for the kernel keeps track of the, for example, the different offsets uh, and, and arguments for the different versions of the kernel API, but that doesn't exist for you probes. For example, imagine we have this full lib, 13.1, and it has a struct, and we want to get information from this struct. From the eBPF side, we don't, we cannot see this struct as a number of, uh, as a name of a type and a field name, but we need to see this struct as a uh, set of offsets. If we want to access, for example, the bytes, we, we know that for this fully version, it will be uh, in the beginning of this flow metrics variable plus four bytes. And th that's the way we need to, to access the information of the structs. But what happens if for our deployed code, the user updates to a new version and this new version uh, adds, for example, a new field in between. For, uh, if we were accessing the error number, error no, um, field, the, and they add a flux in, in that place, we will immediately access part of the flux field and the error no will be in another, in another place. So we need to take care about that. We can use the book information. So if you, get the, if you have the debug information, if you executable, you you can get all or, or you can get at runtime those offsets. But if you uh, many people strips the book information just to reduce the size of their of their of their binaries. So in, in that case, we need to maintain a database, a local database with all the structs of all the fields we access for all the different versions of the libraries we we access. Then this um, relative fragility uh, gets increased when we go to managed runtimes like Go and, and Java. 
uh, because those managed runtimes uh, provide garbage collection. That might mean that an object might change its location uh, during the life of the of the program. Also, we can get managed stacks. We will see that later. Even uh, managed threads like virtual threads, which are not running at the operating system level but run at the application level managed by the runtime so our ebpf code needs to make use of that another uh, also other other aspects like, like linking or calling conventions that can change not only from one language to another but from one compiler to another or from one completion mode to another in for garbage collection in go Fortunately, we don't have so many problems at the moment because that this garbage collection algorithm could change in a, in a future because uh, Go, when passes the garbage collector, doesn't compact memory. That means that if your, if your data is alive, after a garbage a garbage collection, the data will be in the same position. So we can be, uh, we can know safely that our pointers will be still valid. We are, we have us uh, in Go. Uh, however, uh, we we had an issue uh, that uh, when we were trying to instrument Go programs, we had the issue that uh, programs often failed, and that's because Go use uh, Go use Go routines and abstract the thread model into a higher level Go routines, and Go routines have very small stacks. Uh, it happens that when this stack grows too much, Go just grows the stack and might relocate it. That means that the the frame pointer, the the the, the return code could change completely. The, its location since you initially stored the stack at the beginning of a function and you are trying to retrieve that stack from a wrong location at the end of, of a function. So what we do for that is that instead of uh, using you probes, we need to uh, you read probes, we need to use you probes always. This is to know when a function ends, we need to parse the binary code of a program look for return instructions and then attach their u probes on each read instruction that way we might know when a function ends with without uh, letting our, our program to crash that it is what was happening uh, before also with managed threads there's uh, go uh, go routines run on top of build operating system threads, but multiple Go routines runs on a smaller set of threads. So in order to correlate a function start and a function end, we cannot know or we don't know, uh, uh, we cannot relate them by uh, thread ID. Uh, fortunately, we can know the current Go, go routine, which in Go is always defined in a, in, a, in a standard register. So accessing that register, we might use the Go routine pointer instead of the, um, instead of the thread ID. This is valid for Go 117 in advance. This is something that might change in the future, the same way it changed from Go 116 to, to from, for in 117 from 116. Uh, also, we need to be careful with these linkage and calling conventions. For example, from Go 116 to 17, the function calling conventions changed. All the code was broken. So all the auto instrumenter at that time needed to change and support uh, both. Also for the register calling convention, it's not the same as the system VAP ABI. So it will differ in Go than from other uh, languages. And eBPF probes are, always, uh, are also sensible to link eruptions that you need to detect at runtime and, and support. Uh, this is an example of, of, uh, of how we do this, uh, this, uh, this skeleton of UGU probes in, in Go. Uh, instead of getting the thread ID, 
you need to get the, the go routine address. This is a macro, this go routine pointer is a, is a macro. We used to get this go routine address and use it as key of the map. And also, so the, the, um, the arguments, instead of being set in as argument of the u probe, you need to know how is internally, how is the calling convention in order to get it from uh, well, well known uh, registers. And also, instead of u red probes, for example, for this function, server handle stream, you need to set another u probe. This is done dynamically inspecting the, the binary code. Uh, there are some other corner cases that, as we say, that the hit memory reference don't move, but the stacks might move. So make sure your pointers are always are valid. Uh, pointers to hip might, we know that might be uh, or are valid, but for example, pointers to the stack might not be valid during the whole life cycle of your functions. So you need to. Um, you need to take that into uh, into consideration always because also because Go performs escape analysis. So when when you think even if you are allocating something in the heap, Go in the compiler internally might know or might demonstrate that this is mm, not uh, or this can be allocated safely in the stack and then it will allocate that in the stack. So you cannot do so many so many assumptions. You need to inspect your instrumentation target in order to make sure your values are safe. And now Nicola will, will go to that. Uh, go was the relatively simple case. Now the death match is Java. Yeah, so I want to say to the previous implementation for Go, I want to see a contrast. What does it look like for Java? And how is Java different if we wanted to go there? And some of this applies to .NET and other similar technologies, but we'll stack with Java. So the first thing about Java is that there's different implementations, and some of those implementations are completely rewrites and don't use the same technology. So for this purpose of the talk, we'll stick with OpenJDK, which is the most commonly used uh, Java, JVM. Um, now, the important thing here is about garbage collection. We said we go, references don't move. In Java, they always move, uh, because all the garbage collectors that Java have move references around, they copy, and so on. Um, which means the stuff that we did before, where we kind of remembered in a map a certain reference to a pointer that we're going to use later, we can't do that. So uh, to demonstrate a simple picture that we had before, even the simplest garbage collector in Java will do this additional step at the end, not always, but occasionally. So it will compact the memory to reduce the fragmentation of the heap to speed up the heap allocations within the life cycle. Go have chosen not to do that because according to their talk, they won't microsecond uh, stop the world latency, so they don't do that part. Um, now, managed stacks over here, typically they don't exist in Java, like you get those stack max that you can change via the command line, uh, but with the introduction of virtual threads, they do exact same thing as Go routines, so if virtual threads become a thing in the future and people use them more often, then we have the same problem as with Go routines, which means you red probes will not work. Um, now, fortunately, there's a dedicated thread register in the code, similar to Go, that we can use to make keys, but then the question is, what can we store with those keys? Uh, similar to Go, the linkage convention is not, doesn't match System 5 ABI. Now, we can talk about what we, we thought about a solution, so how we could instrument applications or use some level of instrumentation for Java. Well, we can use the probes only. Um, and then we can't remember references because we have to assume that at some point everything will move. Um, if we need to read data from the heap, that needs to happen always on enter of the function. Or if you're lucky, then something gets returned um, at the end of the return of the function, then you can safely read that return value. Um, and since the Go run, actually the Java runtime will recompile methods, we need to maybe instrument more than one method that we like. And uh, of course, just like in Go, we can adapt our linkage. So I mentioned here is so U probes, and but what can actually be? U probes actually used for. So 
um, we can only instrument the JIT compiled methods. So Java JVM start interpreting the code initially, and then later on they compile it with one compiler in OpenJDK case called C1, then later on they compile it with another compiler, the same method called C2, and the C2 can recompile multiple times. So they're extremely difficult to deal with, because which means we have to somehow, um, when they're generated on the fly, there's no binary to inspect, and this binary actually changes over time. Um, so the other kind of problem is that that's not the only problem. The other problem is that inlining is very much unstable. So if you run a program once, you will get one set of actual binary compiled methods. You run it another time, you may get slightly different or completely different set. Why? Because the JVM actually uses a lot of runtime profiling information to guide the inliner to produce more optimal code. So because of that, you cannot be guaranteed that uh, there will be the same methods that you saw last time. Which means if you're targeting instrumentation of a specific functionality of the application, you may need to instrument more than one method because the inlining may be different between the, state, the stable state that you expect to have. Um, so um, the, the other thing that's sort of nasty about Java is that uh, the JVM itself does a lot of code patching. So it would make assumptions about uh, the method it's compiling. Let's say you have multiple classes in extending the same method, same virtual method, and at the beginning when the JIT compiler compiled this method, this, there was only one implementation of this. But later on, when you run the program, some new class gets loaded and this actual assumption gets invalidated. So the JVM runtime will patch all the places where this sort of assumption was being made, which means our approach of disassembling and looking for return instructions may not always work. Why? Because the patch code may not actually disassemble really well and then temporarily use any, lose any context for the disassemblers, so you may get gibberish or garbage and not actually find the right return instruction. So attaching a return of a function can be dicey, not always compatible. So, um, so the question is how do we find these Java symbols? Um, I'm gonna skip to the second point before I go to the first one where the, in the case of GraalVM native, which is also popular in some spaces, this is pretty simple. Uh, because there is a binary, it's compiled one way, and it's always that same binary, so those are good. Now, how do we compile, how do we catch the compiled methods? Well, there's two problems. First is like you can catch the compiled methods as they come, and one way to do it is to attach a U probe on uh, register n method, which is a function in OpenJDK. It's called every time the compiler wants to commit a new method in uh, the code cache. So in this case, you can attach a U probe, send that event over to the user space of the eBPF program, and then drop the previous U probe on that method, attach a new one to the new address, and keep doing that as the methods get recompiled all the time. Um, there's one problem with that. You don't see all the methods, so it depends when you first started running your eBPF program. What about the stuff that was compiled before you started monitoring the calls to end method? Um, so, one, one possibility is that, well, maybe you can dump the list of methods that existed before you went through, and there's programs for that, like the JVM provides JCMD. Fortunately, when they made the decision to disable dynamic agent loading, they didn't disable some of these interfaces. So this is still possible to do with JCMD. You just can't load anymore by default uh, agents. Uh, but this method list and garbage collection stuff you can still do. Um, and if you can control the Java command line, then actually things become a lot simpler. If your application is running in a mode where you actually also uh, deploy the eBPF program and run the Java program, then mm, we stand a better chance. There's command line options in the JVM command line that you can actually, for one thing, uh, get the list of compiled methods that are already out there without attaching it uh, to the JVM. Um, but you can also maybe even control the inlining to say maybe stabilize around this one methods or couple of methods that we're, I'm really interested in actually instrumenting. 
Um, so that's about it about Java. Now, a further step than that we thought about is like, well, there's some languages and runtimes that are impossible. So interpreted, they're just plethora of bytecodes that run inside of some interpretation engine that is written in another programming language or maybe the same programming language, but nonetheless, uh, there's no symbols or that you can particularly attach to. So, for example, like Python running in interpreted mode. Um, there's also partially compiled methods. Java does this, for example. If you had a method that you called once and it was an endless loop, uh, what the JVM will do there is actually we'll start interpreting it. Then later on, there's code that will detect that this is a really hot method, perhaps, and the Java will do on stack replacement, replace the remainder of the method until the point where it was actually stuck in that endless loop with a binary compiled to the method. Now, you lost your chance to actually uh, instrument the beginning of that particular function. So, uh, nothing we can do there. Uh, there's also trace compilers. Trace compilers don't compile based on method or function boundaries. They just compile whatever the interpreter tells them that is hot path and they see it as a stream of uh, some intermediate language, bytecode, or whatever it is, and they turn it into uh, native code. Uh, fortunately for us, like depending on the runtime we're instrumenting, there might be ways that we can instrument some parts of those managed runtimes. Like if they use a lot of native calls like Python does or Node.js or Ruby, then maybe you can instrument those parts, but not the interpreter sides. So what we've implemented so far in our project is that we've done the Go support uh, that's released. Uh, we care mostly about open telemetry observability. So uh, we sort of stayed away from Java.net and those guys because we think that those agents actually by open telemetry uh, are pretty good. So they do a lot of stuff that customers take a use of. Uh, our primary interest in Java.net has been around native binaries where you cannot dynamically load agents and do auto instrumentation. And fortunately for us, those actually do come with symbols um, that actually don't change or recompile on the fly. Uh, and our, I um, mean, future work is that we'll probably add more user level instrumentation for other languages and manage runtimes. And overall, I think also one thing that people sort of miss is that eBPF is also great for um, getting uh, information about the runtime itself. So attaching new probes to the JVM runtime, uh, you can get a lot of information like calculating GC times or in the Go case, maybe even counting the number of Go routines or how much in Node.js the events are stuck on the event loop because those actually parts of the managed runtimes do have symbols, it's actually easy to apply eBPF to get some of that. So to summarize, uh, I think there's some level of eBPF instrumentation that we can do for managed runtimes. Uh, some managed runtimes are much easier to deal with than others. Um, and, and some managed runtimes are almost impossible to do. Uh, I think that typical approaches for static, for dealing, for eBPF instrumentation of static compiled languages can be adapted to some extent and successfully be applied uh, for managed runtimes, but not always. Everything has a limitation in this world. Um, but just like it does in static compiled languages, if the symbol, if a particular Mac function that you want to uh, instrument is inlined in every possibility or in the case where you care about, well, tough luck. Right, so limitations exist in instrumenting static uh, binaries as well. Thank you. That's that's it. You can find us on <laughs> there's this last. <laughs>